Hey, this is Laurel. Welcome back to Laurel's Real Money Talks. We're a podcast that talks about how to make money, how to keep money, how to invest money, how to use a team. This is the second part version of a podcast interview I did with my dear friend. I love this man, Glenn Morshower. If you missed version one, get back over to your app store, uh, listen, download, subscribe to my podcast, listen to version one. Version two is on fire. Love Glenn. And by the way, coming up, he will be in uh, the Ozarks. He's the director of the FBI. Super fun coming out later this year or early in 2022. So listen in to our podcast interview. Welcome to Real Money Talks. Real strategies from the money makers and the world changers that you can use to make millions keep those millions, multiply your wealth, and build your team. Here's your host, author of five New York Times bestsellers, money expert on Dr. Phil, CNN, CNBC, The Street TV, Fox News, and The View, Laurel Langmire. So I know that you have these beautiful acting well studios, and now are you doing the real estate? Did you release all the real estate? And Everything's done, which 100% Zoom. Okay. And I won't be going back. Oh, I'm not going back either. How about that? I'm not going back. I'm going to stay right here and continue to be open to the world on Zoom. Yep. I'm with you. I've asked that a lot because, you know, I was a stage warrior, man. I was on the road two, three days a week. And the only road show I'm doing are to visit my companies in the different places. And I'll put a big table in those places. Like we're going to Boise at the end of the month. I got a development and real estate company up there. Sure. And we'll put, put those trips together. Which I'd love to have you in Savannah, but again, it's way out there, so we'll get there. But uh, well, now the on the road stage stuff, I have missed that, and that I will be going. Will back you go to back for that? In a heartbeat, because for these interviews, I mean, these are nice, the podcasts and so forth, but there is nothing like the live, large audience energy. You know that we've done a bunch of events together. Yeah, and it's coming yeah. back. It looks like speaking events are on the mend. They are. They are. You know, I, actually, I should qualify that. So I'm not going to put them on, but I will visit other people's. Gotcha. So yeah. what is it that's going on in Savannah? Is this another event? In Savannah is, uh, we're going to be doing a big table there, September 27th, 28th. My son, so Logan, you know, went to Georgia, or actually first went to Jacksonville. He went to Florida uh, to school. And mm-hmm. now he's playing uh, in Georgia Southern. So he's just south of Atlanta. Oh, wow. He lives in Statesboro, Georgia. And we are going to go to his football game on the 25th. And rally uh, him playing ball. And then we're going to go back out to Savannah and have a big table there. So we're into spending over 100 people. And Oh, and that's great. Love to have you there. Love yeah, Savannah. And I'll probably be in Atlanta at that time. So it's a, well, it's well, a car ride down to Savannah. Piece of cake. And it's so beautiful. I love it there. I love the Spanish moss in Savannah. Love it. Yeah. I love the food. Love, I love the South. I love I love who Logan's becoming as a man in the South because he's just with such a great group of men and just watching him emerge. Kind of I love getting directions from people in the South because here's the deal. Here's the deal. They look like this. And, and you just say, I, I, is there a Starbucks near you? And they go, OK, here's the deal. You're going to want to get down there on Main Street. OK, <laughs> it's just about a block from here. You're going to turn right. And you're going to take Main Street for, I don't know, two, two and a half miles. And then you're going to see a big oak tree go on your left. Don't turn there. And they tell you what not to do. And you're thinking, why have you just told me to not turn at the oak tree? As though anytime I see an oak tree, I automatically turn left. And I'm like, dude. And then they add, now, about three quarters of a mile past that oak tree where you're not going to turn, you're going to see a Charlie's Hardware Store. And I'm going to tell you what, that Charlie is a butthole. He cheated on his wife 14 times in 23 years. And I'm going, I just want a coffee. Okay. I don't need, I don't need the sexual habits of the people in the area. <laughs> God, I love you, Glenn. I could just hang out with you all day. Uh, So I know your heart and everything we've been talking about are life skills. And I love that you teach through that lens. And so talk about your acting studios, because I know that you love teaching. I I love teaching. I I will teach till the day we leave the planet and on to another place. So how do you merge those? I mean, clearly you have very successful, like you said, you've grown. But you're really, just like I am, even though I teach money, you teach acting, yeah. we're teaching life skills. Absolutely. Right? So kind of speak to to that 
Because I don't think a lot of people get that. I think a lot of people think, well, I got to teach this one thing and I could do everything. Is the abundance really comes when you teach it all, right? And so, yeah, I love being a millionaire. I love being a multimillionaire. But you know what I love? I love the people that I hang out with. I love the contacts. I love the deals. I love the travel and the places I get to go with it. So there's life inside of the money conversation. For you, there's life skills inside of the acting. Speak to that because this isn't just about you cranking out a bunch of actors and no, for me, not, it's not about cranking out a bunch of millionaires. Not so, at all. We're, we're like cranking this. out well humans is what we're yeah. doing. We're in the business of human empowerment. Yeah. And where this came from, Laurel, was many years ago. This goes back 36 years ago. I had a very elevated booking percentage in my auditions that caught a lot of attention. And my agent said, basically, what are you doing out there? Because you're a friggin' booking machine. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we don't want to take anything away from you. We think you're a very good actor, but we also represent people we think have the exact same level of talent you do, but they're not booking like you are. Do you think you could teach this? And I don't know that minus their prompting, I would have ever become a teacher. So it was a significant development that happened. And I said, you know, I, I think I could because there are very specific things that I do in preparation for it. And it's all about growing your humanity. And so I started teaching this program called the Extra Mile 36 years ago. And it was a program on consciousness and specifically the mindsets and there are four of them. As I see, this did not come from a book. It didn't come from a sermon. This was whispered gently to me while I was taking a shower one day. I just heard this understanding. I don't mean that it was audible. I heard it in my head and I immediately raced out and wrote it down. And it's been life changing. And I've been teaching it ever since. And that is that one mindset is the mindset of impossibility. And the theme word in that room is no. So, you know, what if we know? Well, I had always wanted to know. And so their no's are locked and vetoed and ready to be pounced onto anyone who would dare to dream. Room two is possibility. It's the room of neutrality. And their theme word is not no. Their theme word is maybe, which mm -hmm. is progressive. You know, I mean, we've moved up from resistance to openness, which is maybe. It's neither leaning forward nor backward. It's not saying yes or no, but it's saying maybe it's also where listening is first formed because that room they are saying, tell me more. I'm listening. You have my attention. Now we move to room three, which is probability. Their theme word is likely. They see things as likely. You know what? Here's probably what's going to happen. Okay. So this is where optimism is born mm -hmm. because they are eagerly anticipating an outcome. It's probably going to go this way. We're probably going to make that sale. We probably will get married. We probably will wind up with several movies and a TV career, whatever it is. And then the fourth and final room, which is the room that I coach people to really set up shop in and to buy their house there emotionally and spiritually, which is inevitability. And not so shockingly, their theme word is the polar opposite of room one. Their theme word is yes. Just yes. Well, what if we, yes, well, you know, we could always, yes. Well, now have you ever got yes? And you're going, well, I haven't even asked you. I don't care. I know the answer is yes. And so I know that you do this. I know I do it. I know a lot of people do when we take the, Oh, come on with it. Got you. Yeah. Yeah. What so the, the power of yes is everything. And when you, when you take the stage knowing in advance, that of course this goes perfectly. I'll tell you what, that in, when you reside in yes consciousness, it is the elimination of anxiety. Because what is there to be anxious about, about the word yes? Just, of course, this goes well. The podcast goes well. The talk at the university goes well. This TV series goes well. Just you don't hope, wish, or want, and you don't get anxious about things because you understand there's a word here that I want to introduce, and the word is pronoia. P-R-O-N-O-I-A, pronoia. And it is the word that stands for the universe conspiring on our behalf, the opposite of paranoia, which is the universe working against us. I love that. And a lot of people live in paranoia. They, they're they waiting for the shoe to drop, right? What is going to befall our fate? What is going to get ugly here very soon? And people who practice pronoia, again, P-R-O-N-O-I-A, 
they are people who are chronic optimists and they just know that no matter what it looks like, it is still working on our behalf. So mm-hmm. even if we're in a rough stretch of road, somehow your accident in January yep. is already changing who you are 10 years from now. Yep. And it's certainly colorizing what these 10 years between now and then will look like. And it's not like that accident was designed to punish you. Mm -hmm. It's something that occurred in your life. It has the capacity to tenderize you, increase Mm -hmm. your compassion, increase your gratitude, increase your full-fledged participation in this moment because you do fully understand that it might very well be your last. And so it is busy manufacturing a more refined version of Laurel, Mm -hmm. albeit in a very painful way. There's still a better you that is emerging. And I'm a big fan of the word tender. That's why I said a tenderized version of you, one that is leading with your heart Mm -hmm. and that is more open to fully feeling the moment, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And staying open to spontaneity. Mm -hmm. So that's what we do in our acting class. <laughs> I know. I, I know. I, I, just, I love it because I'm going to get so like everyone needs to go to Glenn's acting class. Like, because this is what you're going to get. Right. And the, the, the depth of life lessons. You're one of my favorite interviews. You're like, I just I love your heart. Mm, thanks. Um, so earlier, you said you had a whisper. And I remember you talking for over an hour one time to our audience about whispers. Share with the audience about whispers, because I think we all have them. We do. You're forcing through life and not paying attention to them. But those whispers, they're different than intuitions. But they're close. Speak right. To so there are whisper deniers. Mm-hmm. There are whisper hearers. And then there are whisper followers. Mm-hmm. And I'm a whisper follower. So whispers are common to all people. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to go ahead and call them what I believe they are, which is the voice of God. Mm-hmm. However. Whispers don't only visit believers. Mm -hmm. So atheists are the recipient of whispers. And the whisper is simply that knowingness within. Call it God. Call it the sun. Call it inner radiance. Call it intuition. It doesn't matter. But it is still that beautiful whisper that comes from the deepest place of knowingness within you. And that's what it specializes in. We theorize, here's the difference between us and the whisper. We theorize, it knows. It knows. It doesn't theorize. And so now when we bridge that gap and hone and cultivate a relationship with our whisper, we now are privy to things because now we're in knowingness because we trust that inner voice. And when we take action on it, without vetoing it in the two most common ways that people do veto their whispers, which are to insist that they make sense. So it must come in in a linear form or they'll they'll ignore it. And most whispers are nonlinear, by the way. So we have to be willing to be nonlinear in our hearing and in our obedience. And then the other is that it needs to be convenient for most people, because if it's inconvenient to follow a whisper, they won't do it. But if they only knew, you know, if they only knew, and here's the thing that they need to know, had you been willing to be inconvenienced, it would have changed your life for the better. A mild inconvenience, whatever that might be, following this particular internal directive, which is what a whisper is, a nudge from within, an internal directive, that if we were to have followed that for a week the entire trajectory of our life would have changed and it would have changed for the better. Mm -hmm. Seems like that would be worth following. They can't be accidental. They just can't be. And, you know, on November the 8th, 1976, not that I remember the date, I got the most profound whisper of my lifetime, which was to call Carolyn. And I wasn't shopping for a girlfriend. This was a girl that I remembered from my kid years. In fact, we used to play doctor together which is kind of a fun story. And I called her here in Dallas 
And she answered and was shocked that I had called after all those years. And when she answered the phone, she said, who told you that I've been looking for you? Nine years since we'd spoken. And, you know, I got goosebumps when she said that. And I said, you've been looking for me? And she said, yes, for the last two weeks. I just started thinking about you and looking. Well, clearly, two people were on that same frequency of listening to a whisper because we had an appointment to keep. Mm -hmm. And that appointment was spending the rest of our lives with one another. And everyone thought we were out of my, our mind. We got married when we were 19 and 18. But that whisper occurred when we were 17 and 16. And now we're 62 and 60. And it was the most important whisper of my lifetime. And thank God I took the call. Thank mm -hmm. God I answered the phone to that internal whisper. Because it's why my kids are who they are. Mm -hmm. It's why I have had peace and balance in my life because I married someone who is incredibly fair, mm -hmm. which means everything to me. And I really think it was God's loving arms saying, hey, this whisper is for your entire future. It's going to shape your entire future. You might want to make sure you follow it. And I called her two minutes after I got that whisper, not two hours or two days. It was whisper go to the phone book and called. And we started uh, dating that week, which is pretty incredible. And there've been many more, but that is the most profound one. And so the next time, guys, whoever's listening to this, when you get to a stop sign where normally you would turn right to go home, if you're feeling peculiar for some unexplained reason, turn left or go straight and take a different road home. Don't assume that everything in life must be done habitually because there is a voice within you that is there for your protection. Mm -hmm. The more you listen to it, the more you will be protected. And if I can bottom line it, yeah. the more happy and joyous you will be because you're practicing trust at your very core. You're looking down at your core and saying, you know what? I actually trust you. Mm -hmm. What a beautiful thing to do, to look at your core and say, I trust you. I said to a group I was speaking to last night that one of the most beautiful things you can do for your life is go stand in front of a mirror and go, hi. Wow. I gave them the exact wording. Hi. Wow. You're still here. You have been through so much. I want you to know that I love you and I'm proud of you in that discussion between you and you. And you will feel a cohesiveness to your own future, an alignment and an empowerment where you realize you're playing for your own team. This is not team sabotage. This is team unity. This is you looking at you and saying, I love you and I vow to take care of you. You're still here, baby. You've survived a lot. You are a miracle. I so love you, Glenn. Love you back. You know, it's interesting you brought up the word inconvenience. Mm -hmm. um, we've, we've got this theme in the last few months with several of the folks who either came here as millionaires or multimillionaires, and we're always asked questions. You know, I love taking those questions because I think people have this elusive thought that being a millionaire is so much like the chasm to becoming a millionaire. I mean, it's just some numbers with some more zeros, right? But it right. makes you different or you did something. And everything you've just spoke to is, I'm going to say how I live. I mean, I live in that internal that nudge, that intuition, that very God, you know, led spirit. Yes. And we were laughing kind of, we said we should write a book called The Inconvenience of Becoming a Millionaire. Because almost every big move that I made around hitting some more zeros or another big deal, it was so damn inconvenient. I mean, mm -hmm. hitting on the secret. I was in Aspen teaching. Bob Proctor calls, Laurel, you have to be in Hollywood, like to Beverly Hills tomorrow. To I said, I, Bob, I'm in Aspen. He's like, I don't care. And you say, yes. And you figure it out. You get some team. You bring people in. I mean, I look at like the defining moments that, you know, if I would have said no, I wouldn't have been in secret, right? If I would have said no to the millionaire make when they said, will you write a book? I'm like, I don't know how to write, but I know how to talk. And my talking can become words. Like every defining part of my career, my path had a hell of a lot of inconvenience to it. Sure. Not just a little bit. I mean, and then the amount of inconvenience to it. 
Most people avoid it. So speak to that as one of our. Oh, favorite. I got a beauty for this one. An absolute beauty. So I used to play poker for a living. I don't know if you knew really? this about me. Yeah, for a living. I mean, this is oh, what God. I, I yeah. was always an actor, but in my spare time, I was an avid poker enthusiast. Now, this is no longer the case, and I haven't played in many, many years. But when I was in my 20s, probably from age 21 to about 32, which is when I did Under Siege, I was a five to six night a week player in a casino of playing professional poker at the highest limits. And poker was very good to me until I realized that I had evolved into a creature who was much too sensitive to take money from other people. I couldn't play the game anymore. The very thing I used to be able to do as a caterpillar, when I became a butterfly, I could no longer do it. That was part of my character metamorphosis. And there's nothing wrong with the game. I just had changed. And so I look for win-wins in life. Poker is not a win-win situation. It's not. By design, it's win-lose. In order for you to win, somebody else has to lose. That's the nature of the game. And I realize that the win-lose dynamic is one that disagrees with my soul. It's one of the best things I've ever given up in my life because I realized I was doing something that my soul disagreed with, even though I was doing it profitably. It didn't matter. It just didn't matter. So it's at, I want to do things that are at people's expanse, not their expense. Mm -hmm. Right. So I want to make sure I'm always expanding. And so here's the story in the casino. There were a few what they call rail birds that hang around and I'll keep the story brief, but it is a phenomenal story. Mm -hmm. And a rail bird is someone who goes to the card room without money. You'll like this. And they befriend as many people as they can so that they can always wave to them and go, hey, Glenn, what's up? How you doing, Bobby? Hey, Teddy, what's up? Hey, Barbara, how you been? You got a lucky chip for me? And they ask him for one chip. And the goal is get to know as many people in the club as you can and walk by the people who are winning money. Mm -hmm. Because if they have a lot of extra chips, nobody cares about a chip. And they would graduate from the blue chip games, which are $1 chips, to the 5 and $10 chip games. Wow. And, and if you get 50 people to give you a $5 chip and 50 people is easy, that's $250. Now, you could just get it and leave, but they never do. They always gamble with it. That's what they're trying to do is fund themselves. And they've already gotten busted out with their own money. So that's what they do. So there was this one guy who I would describe as a royal pain in the butt that every time I was in the building, hey, Red, he didn't even bother to call me Glenn. Hey, Red, got a lucky chip for me. Hey, Red. And I always took care of this guy. I just always gave him something. Ask me, was it inconvenient? It was, it was inconvenient. Yes, it was inconvenient is the point. It was a pain in the butt. So this guy, he was into me for easily easily a thousand bucks over the years, easily a thousand. And I, you know, I know I'm never going to get it back, but I believe in this rewritten version of the golden rule, which is not only do unto others as you would have them do unto you, but rather do unto others as you would have life do unto you because he's not in a position to help me. But as long as I'm coming from, from generosity and kindness and love and support, life takes care of me. I don't know how to explain it any better than that. So I've been helping this guy for years. I'm now in Vancouver, British Columbia, working on the X-Files. And I'm on my last day of the shoot when I get a phone call that they want me to get on a plane pronto the next day to go to Los Angeles to uh, Century City, the, you know, the big high rises in Century City, Twin Towers. And they want me to read for a lead in a television series. It's a sitcom with James Avery. I don't know if you've ever watched the show Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Yeah, But he is the heavy bearded dude on that show. He plays the character of Uncle Phil. Yeah. And he is packaged with the show and it will be the lead opposite him. They send me the script. The script is about a down and out gambler. And the script is written by a guy named Fred Stone. And the character name in the show is Woody which was the Railbird's name that I knew in Los Angeles. Could it be that this guy who was one cut above homeless has written a script 
that has been purchased and is going to be made into a sitcom. The elevator doors open. No way. And he's standing there. You're kidding. This guy that I had helped for years. And the thing he says to me, as soon as the elevator doors open, he goes, shh, don't tell anyone. They think I'm a friggin' genius for writing this script. They have no idea that this script is about me. It's about my own life. He said, I want you to play me. And there are several other here people reading, but you're the guy I want. And son of a gun, they hired me. And this guy who I had helped sending him money, $5 chips at a time, not only paid me back, but paid me back in droves with all the money I made on that sitcom. I love that. What a like the, the official least likely person on the planet <laughs> to ever <laughs> give me a job. And so what this begs the question is, what's your take on miracles? Mm. How low is your ceiling on your concept? of miracles. And it has been shown to me that truly anything can happen. And that changes your life when you live in that bandwidth of possibility that anything can happen. The term a lot of people would have called him is a bum. Now, I'd, I would never have called him that. But a lot of people would say, ah, get away, you know, just quit bumming money. You're always bumming money. So the guy who did that put a television series in my lap. Brilliant. Life's brilliant. Life's amazing. Life is amazing. So we need to wrap uh, yes. our, our podcast. What would you say? We have uh, listeners all over the world in kind of conclusion of, uh, I say this part of interview, I, I want you back. I want to see you in Savannah. I want to hug you. What would you say to those that are listening from all over that? I would hope coming out of COVID coma and getting. So I would say this, I would say right where you are right here, right now, not later, right now. Stop. Close your eyes. Take a deep breath. And then open them and look at this dance that we are all right smack dab in the middle of. Because it's a really cool gig. Life is a cool gig. And then remember that it has been said, Laurel, and I agree with it, that the vast majority of the problems we inherit in our lives come as a direct result from a momentary lapse in the remembrance of exactly who it is we are. Mm. A momentary lapse. And if we take time to remember that, and I would add this, not only who we are, but the beauty of the very system in which we operate, meaning this world. Mm. And if you do that, you're going to be fine because the inevitable result will be that you have fallen back in love with the entirety of your life. Mm. Boy, do people need that today. One more shower before we leave. Uh, I love you to pieces. Cannot wait to see and hug you. Ozarks, give us one little insight. Well, they, you know, they won't let me talk about it, but I will tell you that I had a blast and all of my stuff in the uh, episodes that I did, all of it is with Laura Lenny and Jason Bateman. All of it. And uh, had a chance to work with them both extensively. And God only knows what will happen as the season unfolds. And I go back for more. But it was tremendously fun. And it's just a great show. And I didn't realize. I knew I love it. I know a lot of people that watch it. But when I made a post about Ozark on my Facebook page, I don't think I've ever had more responses. Mm -hmm. and, and that tells me how much that show is loved. So people are frothing at the mouth to see it. Yeah. And that's exciting. I will tell you that I play the head of the FBI. I cannot wait. Cannot so. wait to see it. And uh, if you ever just, you know, need to hear Glenn's big, powerful voice, go on the right Transformers. <laughs> <laughs> My kids love it. They're like, there's Glenn again. <laughs> so love you, dear friend. Thanks, sweetie. Uh, appreciate you. Big hugs and love to you. Take care. Those of you, again, that have been listening and watching, this is Laurel's Real Money Talks. We are here every week talking about life, which uh, inevitably, if you uh, so choose to take the steps, will make you a millionaire. Talk to you soon. Talk on the next episode. Cheers. 
So how was that? One hour with Mr. Glenn Morshauer, amazing actor, friend, and businessman. Has an extraordinary acting school. Was in Dallas, actually. I have to correct that. It's now virtual. If at any time in our podcast you have a question, go to asklaurel.com. Put in your information. Ask a question. Make a request. We're right here to support you on your journey to becoming a millionaire. Thanks for listening to the Real Money Talks podcast. Your host has been Laurel Langmire, author of five New York Times bestsellers, money expert on Dr. Phil, CNN, CNBC, The Street TV, Fox News, and The View. Want to learn more about off Wall Street investing, tax strategies, and multi-million dollar business strategies? Visit liveoutloud.com slash podcast for past episodes, show notes, and resources. For some special wealth building gifts only for Laurel's podcast listeners, visit liveoutloud.com slash podcast gifts. Do you have a burning question for Laurel? Visit asklaurel.com to submit your question, and it may just be covered on a podcast episode. So stay tuned and be sure to subscribe to get new episodes every week.